king said politely, stunned by such a lot of declamation. Um, surely she would. Surely we are important from what we've done. How? demanded his tutor fiercely. Well, I must say, look at the buildings which we have made on the earth, and towns, and arable fields. The great barrier reef! Ooh, ooh! Observed Archimedes, looking at the ceiling. Is a building a thousand miles long, and it was built entirely by, ooh, ooh, insects. But that's only a reef. Merlin dashed his hat on the floor in his usual way. Can you never learn to think impersonally? He demanded. The coral insect would have as much right to reply to you that London is only a town. Even then, if all the towns in the world were placed end to end, Archimedes said, If you begin producing all the towns in the world, I shall begin producing all the coral islands and atolls, and then we will weigh them carefully against each other, and we shall see ooh, ooh, what we shall see. Perhaps coral insects are more important than men, then. But this is only one species. Goat said slyly, <laughs> The committee had a note somewhere about the beaver, I think, in which he was said to have made whole seas and continents. The birds, began Ballon with exaggerated nonchalance, by carrying the seeds of trees in their droppings, are said to have made forests so large. Them rabbits, interrupted the urchin. Why, they're now depopulated Australia. The foraminifera of whose bodies the white cliffs of Dover are actually composed. The locusts. Merlin held up his hand. Give him the humble earthworm, he said majestically. So the animals recited in unison. <clears throat> the naturalist Darwin has pointed out that there are about 25,000 earthworms in every field acre, that they turn over in England alone, 320 million tons of soil a year, and that they are to be found in almost every region of the world. In 30 years, they will alter the whole Earth's surface to the depth of seven inches. The Earth without worms, says the immortal Gilbert White, would soon become cold, hard-bound, void of fermentation, and consequently sterile. <laughs> it, it seems to me, <laughs> said the king happily, for these high matters seem to be taking him far from Mordred and Lancelot, far from the place where, as they put it in King Lear, humanity must perforce prey on itself like monsters of the deep, into the peaceful world where people thought and talked and loved each other without the misery of doing. It, it seems to me that if what you say is true, that it would do my fellow humans good to take them down a peg. If they could be taught to look at themselves as another species of mammal for a change, they might find the novelty of tonic. Tell me what conclusions the committee has come to, for I'm sure you've been discussing it, about the human animal. We have found ourselves in difficulty about the name. What name? Homo sapiens, explained the grass snake. It became obvious that sapiens was hopeless as an adjective, but the trouble was to find another. Archimedes said, You remember that Merlin once told you why the chaffinch was called Celebs? Ooh, ooh. A good adjective for a species has to be appropriate to some peculiarity of it, uh, like that. The first suggestion, said Merlin, was naturally ferox, since man is the most ferocious of the animals. It is strange that you should mention ferox. I was thinking that very word an hour ago. But you're exaggerating, of course, when you say that he is more ferocious than the tiger. 
tiger. Am I? I've always found that men were decent on the whole. Merlin took off his spectacles, sighed deeply, polished them, put them on again, and examined his disciple with curiosity, as if he might at any moment begin to grow some long, soft, furry ears. Try to remember the last time you went for a walk, he suggested mildly. A walk? Yes, a walk in the English country lanes. Here comes Homo sapiens. Taking his pleasure in the cool of the evening, picture the scene. Here is a blackbird singing in the bush. Does it fall silent and fly away with a curse? Not a bit of it. It sings all the louder and perches on his shoulder. Here is a rabbit nibbling the short grass. Does it rush in terror towards its burrow? Not at all. It hops towards him. Here are field mouse, grass snake, fox, hedgehog, badger. Do they conceal themselves or accept his presence? Why, there is not a humble animal in England that does not flee from the shadow of man as a burnt soul from purgatory. Not a mammal, not a fish, not a bird. Extend your walk so that it passes by a river bank and the very fish will dart away. It takes something, believe me, to be dreaded in all the elements there are. And do not, he added quickly, laying his hand on Arthur's knee, do not imagine that they fly from the presence of one another. If a fox walked down the lane, perhaps the rabbit would scuttle, but the bird in the tree and the rest of them would agree to his being. If a hawk swung by, perhaps the blackbird would cower, but the fox and the others would allow its arrival. Only man, only the earnest member of the Society for the Invention of Cruelty to Animals, only he is dreaded by every living thing. But these animals are are not what you could really call wild. A tiger, for instance. Merlin stopped him with his hand again. Let the walk be in the darkest Indies, he said, if you like. There is not a tiger, not a cobra, not an elephant in the Afric jungle, but what he flies from man. A few tigers who have gone mad from toothache will attack him, and the cobra, if hard-pressed, will fight in self-defense. But if a sane man meets a sane tiger on a jungle path, it is the tiger who will turn aside. The only animals which do not run from man are those which have never seen him. The seals, penguins, dodos, or whales of the Arctic seas. And these, in consequence, are immediately reduced to the verge of extinction. Even the few creatures which prey on man, the mosquito and the parasitic flea, even these are terrified of their host and keep a sharp lookout to be beyond his fingers. Homo ferox! Oh, that rarity in nature, an animal which will kill for pleasure. There is not a beast in this room who would not scorn to kill except for a meal. Man effects to feel indignation at the shrike who keeps a small ladder of snails, etc., speared on thorns. Yet his own well-stocked ladder is surrounded by herds of charming creatures like the mooning bullock and the sheep with its intelligent and sensitive face who are kept solely in order to be slaughtered on the verge of maturity and devoured by their carnivorous herder whose teeth are not even designed for those of a carnivore. You should read Lamb's letter to Salve about baking moles alive and sport with cockchafers and cats in bladders and crimping skates and anglers, those meek inflictors of pangs intolerable. Homo ferox, the inventor of cruelty to animals, who will rear pheasants at enormous expense for the pleasure of killing them, who will go to the trouble of training other animals, to kill, who will burn living rats, as I have seen done in Eriu, in order that their shrieks may intimidate the local rodents, who will forcibly degenerate the livers of domestic geese in order to make himself a tasty food, who will saw the growing horns of cattle for convenience in transport, 
will blind goldfinches with a needle to make them sing, who will boil lobsters and shrimps alive, although he hears their piping screams, who will turn on his own species in war and kill 19 million every hundred years, who will publicly murder his fellow men when he has adjudged them to be criminals and who has invented a way of torturing his own children with a stick or of exporting them to concentration camps called schools where the torture can be applied by proxy. Yes, you are right to ask whether man can properly be described as ferox, for certainly the word in its natural meaning of wildlife among decent animals ought never to be applied to such a creature. Goodness, <laughs> said the king. You seem to lay it on. But the old magician would not be appeased. The reason, he said, why we felt doubts about using ferox was because Archimedes suggested that stultus would be more appropriate. Stultus? I thought we were intelligent. Uh, in um, one of the uh, miserable wars when I was a... Uh, Younger man, said the magician, taking a deep breath. It was found necessary to issue to the people of England a set of printed cards which entitled them to food. These cards had to be filled in by hand before the food could be bought. Each individual had to write a number in one part of the card, his name in another part, and the name of the food supplier in a third. He had to perform these three intellectual feats. One number and two names, or else he would get no food and starve to death. His life depended on the operation. It was found, in the upshot, so far as I recollect, that two-thirds of the population were unable to perform the sequence without mistake. And these people, we are told by the Catholic Church, are to be trusted with immortal souls. Uh, uh, are you sure... Of the facts, asked the badger doubtfully. The old man had the grace to blush. Uh, he said, I, I did not note them down, uh, he said, but uh, they're true in substance, if not in detail. I clearly remember, for instance, that a woman was standing in a queue for bird seed in the same war, who upon interrogation was discovered to possess no birds. Arthur objected. It does not prove very much even if they were unable to write their three things properly. If they had been any of the other animals, they would not have been able to write at all. The short answer to that, replied the philosopher, is that not a single human being can bore a hole in an acorn with his nose. Uh, I do not understand. Oh, well, the insect called Balaninus elephas is able to bore acorns in the way I mentioned, but it cannot write. Man can write, but cannot bore acorns. These are their own specializations. The important difference is, however, that while Balaninus bores his holes with the greatest efficiency, man, as I have shown you, does not write with any efficiency at all. That is why I say that species for species, man is more inefficient, more stultus than his fellow beasts. Indeed, no sensible observer would expect the contrary. Man has been so short a time upon our globe that he can scarcely be expected to have mastered much. The king had found that he was beginning to feel depressed. Did, did you think of many... Other names, he asked. There was a third a suggestion made by Badger. At this, the happy Badger shuffled his feet with satisfaction, peeped sideways at the company round the corner of his spectacles and examined his long nails. Impoliticus. Homo impoliticus. You remember that Aristotle defined us as political animals? A badger suggested examining this, and after we had looked at his politics, impoliticus seemed to be the only word to use. Go on, uh, if you must. We found that the political ideas of Homo ferox were of two kinds. Either that problems could be solved by force, or that they could be solved by argument. 
The ant men of the future who believe in force consider that you can determine whether twice two is four by knocking people down who disagree with you. The Democrats who are to believe in argument consider that all men are entitled to an opinion because all are born equal. I am as good a man as you are. The first instinctive ejaculation of the man who is not. If neither force nor argument can be relied on, I, I do not see what, what can be done. Neither force nor argument nor opinion are thinking. Argument is only a display of mental force, a sort of fencing with points in order to gain a victory, not for truth. Opinions are the blind alleys of lazy or of stupid men who are unable to think. Opinion can never stand beside truth. At present, however, Homo impoliticus is content either to argue with opinions or to fight with his fists instead of waiting for the truth in his head. It will take a million years before the mass of men can be called political animals. Well, what are we then uh, at present? We find that at present the human race is divided politically into one wise man, nine knaves and 90 fools out of every hundred. That is, by an optimistic observer. The nine knaves assemble themselves under the banner of the most knavish among them and become politicians. The wise man stands out because he knows himself to be hopelessly outnumbered and devotes himself to poetry, mathematics, or philosophy. While the ninety fools plod off behind the banners of the nine villains, according to fancy, into the labyrinths of chicanery, malice, and warfare. It is pleasant to have command, observes Sancho Panza, even over a flock of sheep. And that is why the politicians raise their banners. It is, moreover, the same thing for the sheep, whatever the banner. If it is democracy, then the nine knaves will become members of parliament. If fascism, they will become party leaders. If communism, commissars. Nothing will be different except the name. The fools will still be fools, the knaves still leaders, the results still exploitation. As for the wise man, his lot will be much the same under any ideology. Under democracy, he will be encouraged to starve to death in a garret. Under fascism, he will be put in a concentration camp. Under communism, he will be liquidated. This is an optimistic, but on the whole, a scientific statement of the habits of homo impoliticus. The king said grimly, Well, I'm sorry. I suppose I'd better go away and drown myself. I'm cheeky, insignificant, ferocious, stupid, and impolitic. It hardly seems to be worth our going on. But at this the animals seemed much upset. They rose in a body, stood round him, fanned him, and offered him drink. No, they said. Really, we were not trying to be rude. Honestly, we were trying to help. There, do not take it to heart. We are sure there must be plenty of humans who are sapiens and not a bit ferocious. We were telling you these things as a sort of foundation so as to make it easier to solve your puzzle later. Come now, ooh, ooh, have a glass of Madeira uh, and think no more about it. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Truly, we think that man is the most marvelous creature anywhere. Quite the best there is. And they turned upon Merlin crossly, saying, Now look what you've done. This is the result of all your jibber and jabber. The poor king is perfectly miserable and all because you throw your weight about and exaggerate and, and patter like a poop. Merlin only replied, Even the Greek definition, Anthropos, he who looks up, is inaccurate. Man seldom looks above his own height. After adolescence. 
The new Arthur, the oiled bolt, was cosseted back to good humor, but he immediately committed the blunder of opening the subject once again. Surely, the affections of men, their love and heroism and patience, surely these are respectable things. His tutor was not abashed by the scolding which he had received. He accepted the gauge with pleasure. Do you suppose that the other animals have no love or heroism or patience? Or, which is more important, no cooperative affection? The love lives of ravens, the heroism of a pack of weasels, the patience of small birds nursing a cuckoo, the cooperative love of bees... All these things are shown much more perfectly on every side in nature than they have ever been shown in man. Surely, man must have some respectable feature. I am inclined to think that there may be one. This, insignificant and childish as it must seem, I mention in spite of all the lucubrations of that fellow Chalmers Mitchell, I refer to man's relation with his pets. In certain households there are dogs which are of no use as hunters or as watchmen, and cats which refuse to go mousing, but which are treated with a kind of vicarious affection by their human fellows, in spite of uselessness or even trouble. I cannot help thinking that any traffic in love which is platonic and not given in exchange for other commodities must be remarkable. I knew a donkey once who lived in the same field with a horse of the same sex. They were deeply attached to one another, although nobody could see that either of them was able to confer a material benefit on the other. This relationship does, it seems to me, exist to a respectable extent between Homo ferox and uh, his hounds in certain cases, but it also exists among the ants, uh, so we must not put too much store upon it. Goat observed slyly. Parasites. At this, Caval got off his master's lap, and he and the new king walked over to the goat on stiff legs. Caval spoke in human speech for the first and last time in his long life, in unison with his master. His voice sounded like a Teuton's speaking through a trumpet. Did you say parasites? You say parasites. Just say that once again, will you, until we punch your head? The goat regarded them with amused affection, but refused to have a row. If you punched my head, you'd get a pair of bloody knuckles. Besides, I take it back. They sat down again, while the king congratulated himself on having something nice in his heart, at any rate. Caval evidently thought the same thing, for he licked his nose. What I can't understand is why you should take the trouble to think about man and his problems, or to sit in committee on them, if the only respectable thing about him is the way he treats a few pets. Why not let him extinguish himself without fuss? This set the committee a problem. They remained, still to think it over, holding the mahogany fans between their faces and the firelight, and watching the inverted flames in the smoky brown of the Madeira. Oh, oh, it is because we love you, King, yourself, said Archimedes eventually. This was the most wonderful compliment which he had ever received. It is because the creature is uh, young, said the goat. Young and helpless creatures make you want to aid them uh, instinctively. It is because helping is a good thing. Anyway, said T. Natrix, there is something important in humanity, said Balin. I cannot at present describe it. Merlin said, it is because one likes to tinker with things, to play with possibilities. The hedgehog gave the best reason, which was simply, why shouldn't one? And then they fell silent musing on the flames.
Okay, here we go. Perhaps I have painted a dark picture of the humans, said Merlin doubtfully. Not very dark, but it might have been a shade lighter. It was because I wanted you to understand about looking at the animals. I did not want you to think that man was too grand to do that. In the course of a long experience of the human race, I have learned that you can never make them understand anything unless you rub it in. You are wanting me to find something out by learning from the beasts. Yes, at last we are getting to the object of your visit. There are two creatures which I forgot to show you when you were small. And unless you see them now, we shall get no further. I will do what you like. They are the ant and the wild goose. We want you to meet them tonight. Of course, it will be only one kind of ant out of many hundreds, but it is a kind which we want you to see. Very well. I'm ready and willing. Have you the sanguine spell at hand, my badger? The wretched animal immediately began to rummage in its chair, searching inside the seams, lifting the corner of the carpet and turning up slips of paper covered with Merlin's handwriting in all directions. The first slip was headed, More Hubris Under Victoria. It said... Dr. John of Gaddiston, court physician to Edward II, claimed to have cured the king's son of smallpox by wrapping the patient up in red cloth, putting red curtains on the windows and seeing that all the hangings of the room were red. This raised a merry Victorian guffaw at the expense of medieval simplicity until it was discovered by Dr. Niels Finsen of Copenhagen in the 20th century that red and infrared light really did affect the pustules of smallpox, even helping in the cure of the disease. The next slip said briefly, Half a rose and over each way on Golden Miller. The third, which smelt strongly of quelque fleur and was not in Merlin's hand, said, Queen Philippa's monument, Charing Cross, 7.30, under the spire. There were a lot of kisses on the bottom of it, and on the back some notes for a poem to be addressed to the sender. These were in Merlin's writing and said, Hui, a kue, a chop suey. The poem itself, which began, Kui, Nimui, was erased. Another slip was headed, Other Races, Victorian Condescension to, as well as to own ancestors, animals, etc. It said, Colonel Wood Martin, the antiquarian, writing in 1895, observes with a giggle that one of the most depraved of all races, the now extinct Tasmanians, believed that stones, especially certain kinds of quartz crystals, could be used as mediums or as means of communication with living persons at a distance. Within a few years of this note, wireless was imported into the Western Hemisphere. I prefer to conjecture that these depraved people were a million years in front of the colonel, along the same foul road, and that they had become extinct by constantly listening to swing music on their crystal sets. Uh, 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 here we are, said Badger. Uh, I think this is it. He handed over a strip on which was written, Formica est exemplo magni laboris. The ant is an example of great industry. Date him of the purpose. It proved ineffectual. At last, everybody was commanded to stand up, search on their chairs, look in their pockets, etc. The hedgehog, producing a tattered fragment covered with dry mud and crumbled leaves on which he had been sitting, asked, Beyond sick. After it had been wiped, flapped, and dusted, it was found to read, Dragul's Walt Tonight or Dog. And Merlin said, It was the one they wanted. So a couple of ants' nests were fetched from the meat safe, where they stood supported in saucers of water. They were placed on a table in the middle of the room, 
while the animals sat down to watch. For you could see inside the nests by means of glass plates colored red. Arthur was made to sit on the table beside the larger nest. The inverted pentagram was drawn. And Merlin solemnly pronounced the cantrip. Well, we have reached it at last. The end of our winding story. Arthur of England went back to the world to do his duty as well as he could. He called a truce with Mordred, having made up his mind that he must offer half his kingdom for the sake of peace. To tell the truth, he was prepared to yield it all, if necessary, as a possession that had long ceased to be of value to him, and he had come to know for sure that peace was more important than a kingdom. But he felt it was his duty to retain a half, if he could, and it was for this reason, that if he had even half a world to work on, he might be able still to introduce in it the germs of that good sense which he had learned from geese and animals. The truce was made, the armies drawn up in their battles face to face, each had a standard made from a ship's mast set on wheels, at the top of which a small box held the consecrated host, while from the masts there flew the banners of the dragon and the thistle. The knights of Mordred's party were dressed in sable armor, their plumes were sable also, and on their arms the scarlet whip of Mordred's badge glared with a sinister tint of blood. Perhaps they looked more terrible than they felt. It was explained to the waiting ranks that none of them must make a hostile demonstration, but all must keep their swords in sheath. Only for fear of treachery it was told that they might charge to rescue if any sword was seen unharnessed at the party. Arthur went forward to the space between the armies with his staff, and Mordred, with his own staff in their black accoutrements, came out to meet him. They encountered, and the old king saw his son's face once again. It was taut and haggard. He too, poor man, had strayed beyond sorrow and solitude to the country of Kenakwer, but he had gone without a guide and lost his way. The treaty was agreed on, to the surprise of all, more easily than had been hoped. The king was left with half his realm. For a moment, joy and peace were in the balance. But at that knife edge of a moment, the old Adam reared itself in a different form. The feudal war, baronial oppression, individual might, even ideological rebellion, he had settled them all in one way or another, only to be beaten on the last lap now by the apiosotic fact that man was a slayer by instinct. A grass snake moved in the meadow near their feet, close to an officer of Mordred's staff. This officer stepped back instinctively and swung his hand across his body, his arm lit with the whip showing for a second's flash. The bright sword flamed into being to destroy the so-called viper. The waiting armies, taking it for treachery, raised their shout of rage. The lances on both sides bowed to rest. And as King Arthur ran towards his own array, an old man with white hair trying to stem the endless tide, holding up the knuckled hands in a gesture of pressing them back, struggling to the last against the flood of might, which had burst out all his life at a new place wherever he had dammed it. So the tumult rose, the war yell sounded, and the meeting waters closed above his head. Lancelot arrived too late. He had made his best speed, but it had been in vain. All he could do was to pacify the country and give burial to the dead. Then, when a semblance of order had been restored, he hurried to Guinevere. She was supposed to be in the Tower of London still, for Mordred's siege had failed, but Guinevere had gone. In those days, the rules of convents were not so strict as they are now. Often, they were more like hostelries for their well-born patrons. Guinevere had taken the veil at Almsbury. She felt that they had suffered enough and had caused enough suffering to others. She refused to see her ancient lover or to talk it over. She said, which was patently untrue, that she wished to make her peace with God. Guinevere never cared for God. She was a good theologian, but that was all. The truth was that she was old and wise, 
She knew that Lancelot did care for God most passionately, that it was essential he should turn in that direction. So for his sake, to make it easier for him, the great queen now renounced what she had fought for all her life, now set the example and stood to her choice. She had stepped out of the picture. Lancelot guessed a good deal of this, and when she refused to see him, he climbed the convent wall with Gallic, aging gallantry. He waylaid her to expostulate, but she was adamant and brave. Something about Mordred seems to have broken her lust for life. They parted, never to meet on earth. Guinevere became a worldly abbess. She ruled her convent efficiently, royally, with a sort of grand contempt. The little pupils of the school were brought up in the great tradition of nobility. They saw her walking in the grounds upright, rigid, her fingers flashing with hard rings, her linen clean and fine and scented against the rules of her order. The novices worshipped her unanimously with schoolgirl passions and whispered about her past. She became a grand old lady. When she died at last, her Lancelot came for the body with his snow-white hair and wrinkled cheeks to carry it to her husband's grave. There, in the reputed grave, she was buried, a calm and regal face, nailed down and hidden in the earth. As for Lancelot, he became a hermit in earnest. With seven of his own knights as companions, he entered a monastery near Glastonbury and devoted his life to worship. Arthur, Guinevere, and Elaine were gone, but his ghostly love remained. He prayed for all of them twice a day with all his never-beaten might and lived in glad austerities apart from man. He even learned to distinguish bird songs in the woods and to have time for all the things which had been denied to him by Uncle Dap. He became an excellent gardener and a reputed saint. Ipse says a medieval poem about another old crusader, a great lord like Lancelot in his day, and one who also retired from the world. Ipse post militi aequosum temporalis illustratis gratia doni spiritualis, esse Christi cupiens miles specialis in hac domo monacus factus est claustralis. He, after the bustle of temporal warfare, enlightened with the grace of a spiritual gift, covetous to be the special soldier of Christ, in this house was made a cloistered monk. More than usually placid, gentle, and benign, as white as a swan on account of his old age, bland and affable and lovable, he possessed in himself the grace of the Holy Spirit. For he often frequented Holy Church, joyfully listened to the mysteries of the Mass, proclaimed such praises as he was able, and mentally ruminated the heavenly glory. His gentle and jocose conversation, highly commendable and religious, was thus pleasing to the whole fraternity because it was neither stuffy nor squeamish. Here, as often as he rambled across the cloister, he bowed from side to side to the monks, and he saluted with a bob of his head thus the ones whom he loved most intimately. Hic per claustrum quotiens transiens me avit hinc et hinc ad monacus caput inclinavit, et sic nutu capitis eos salutavit, quos affectu intimo plurimum amavit. When his own death hour came, it was accompanied by visions in the monastery. The old abbot dreamed of bells sounding most beautifully, and of angels with happy laughter hauling Lancelot to heaven. They found him dead in his cell in the act of accomplishing the third and last of his miracles, for he had died in what was called the odor of sanctity. When saints die, their bodies fill the room with lovely scent, perhaps of new hay or of blossom in the spring or of the clean seashore. Hector pronounced his brother's keen, one of the most touching pieces of prose in the language. He said, Ah, Lancelot! Thou wert head of all Christian knights. And now I dare say thou, Sir Lancelot, there thou liest that thou were never matched of earthly knight's hand. And thou were the courtliest knight that ever bare shield, and thou were the truest friend of thy lover that ever bestrode horse, and thou wert the truest lover of a sinful man that ever loved woman, and thou were the kindest man that ever strake with sword, and thou were the godliest person that ever came among press of knights, 
and thou art the meekest man and gentlest that ever ate in hall among ladies, and thou art the sternest knight to thy mortal foe that ever put spear in rest. The round table had been smashed at Salisbury, its few survivors thinning out as the years went by. At last, there were only four of them left. Bors, the misogynist, Berry, Hector, and de Marie. These old men made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land for the repose of the souls of all their comrades, and there they died upon a good Friday for God's sake, the last of the round table. Now there are none of them left, only knights of the bath and of other orders, degraded by comparison. About King Arthur of England, that gentle heart and centre of it all, there remains a mystery to this day. Some think that he and Mordred perished on each other's swords. Robert of Thornton mentions that he was attended by a surgeon of Salerno, who found by examination of his wounds that he could never be whole again. So he said, In Manus, into thy hands I commend my spirit, boldly on the place where he lay, and speak no more. Those who adhere to this account claim that he was buried at Glastonbury under a stone which said, Hic jacet Arturus rex quandam rex que futuris. Here lies Arthur, the once and future king, and that his body was exhumed by Henry II as a counterblast to Welsh nationalism. For the Cymri were claiming even then that the great king had never perished. They believed that he would come again to lead them and they also mendaciously asserted, as usual, his British nationality. Adam of Domerum tells us, on the other hand, that the exhumation took place in April 1278 under Edward I, and that he himself was a witness of the proceedings, while it is known that a third search took place in vain under Edward III, who, by the way, revived the round table in 1344 as a serious order of knighthood like the Garter. Whatever the real date may have been, Tradition has it that the bones when exhumed were of gigantic stature, and Guinevere's had golden hair. Then there is another tale, widely supported, that our hero was carried away to the Vale of Avalach by a collection of queens in a magic boat. These are believed to have ferried him across the Severn to their own country, there to heal him of his wounds. The Italians have got hold of an idea about a certain Arturo Magno who was translated to Mount Etna, where he can still be seen. <coughs> Occasionally, they say. Don Quixote, the Spaniard, a very learned gentleman, indeed he went mad on account of it, maintains that he became a raven, an assertion which may not seem so wholly ridiculous to those who have read our little story. Then there are the Irish who have muddled him up with one of the Fitzgeralds and declare that he rides round a wrath with sword upraised to the Londonderry air. The Scots, who have a legend about Arthur nicht war on nicht we guilt in spur and candle licht, still swear to him in Edinburgh, where they believe that he presides from Arthur's seat. The Bretons claim to have heard his horn and to have seen his armour, and they also believe he will return. A book called The High History of the Holy Grail, which was translated by an irascible scholar called Dr. Sebastian Evans, says, on the contrary, that he was safely buried in a house of religion that standeth at the head of the Moors' adventurers. A Miss Jessie L. Weston mentions a manuscript which she pleases to call 1533, supported by Le Mortatur, in which it is stated that the queen who came to carry him away was none other than the aged enchantress Morgan, his half-sister, and that she took him to a magic island. Dr. Summer regards the entire account as absurd. A lot of people called Wolfram von Eschenbach, Ulrich von Zatzikow, and Dr. Weschler, Professor Zimmer, Mr. Nutt, and so forth, either scout the question wholly or remain in learned confusion. Chaucer, Spencer, Shakespeare, Milton, Wordsworth, Tennyson, and a number of other reliable witnesses agree that he is still on earth. Milton inclining to the view that he is underneath it. Arturum quae etiam subteris bella moventem, and Arthur too stirring up wars beneath the earth. 
while Tennyson is of the opinion that he will come again to visit us like a modern gentleman of stateliest port, possibly like the Prince Consort. Shakespeare's contribution is to place the beloved Falstaff at his death, not in Abraham's, but in Arthur's bosom. The legends of the common people are beautiful, strange, and positive. Gervais of Tilbury, writing in 1212, says that in the woods of Britain, the foresters tell that on alternate days, about noon or at midnight, when the moon is full and shiny, they often see an array of huntsmen who, in answer to inquirers, say they are of the household and fellowship of Arthur. These, however, were probably real bands of Saxon poachers like the followers of Robin Wood, who had named their gang in honor of the ancient king. The men of Devon are accustomed to point out the chair and oven of Arthur among the rocks of that coast. In Somersetshire, there are some villages called East and West Camel, Camel Lot, mentioned by Leyland, which are beset with legends of a king still sitting in a golden crown. It is to be noted that the river Ivil, whence, according to Drayton, our knightly deeds and brave achievements sprung, is in the same county. So is South Cadbury, whose rector reports his parishioners as relating how folks do say that in the night of the full moon, King Arthur and his men ride round the hill and their horses are shod with silver and a silver shoe has been found in the track where they do ride. And when they have ridden round the hill, they do stop to water their horses at the wishing well. Finally, there is the little village of Bodmin in Cornwall whose inhabitants are certain that the king inhabits a local tumulus. In 1113, they even assaulted within the sanctuary a party of monks from Brittany, an unheard of thing to do, because they had thrown doubts upon the legend. It has to be admitted that some of these dates scarcely fit in with the thorny subject of Arthurian chronology. And Mallory, that great man who is the noblest source of all this history, maintains a discreet reserve. As for myself, I cannot forget the hedgehog's last farewell, coupled with Quixote's hint about the animals and hint, 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 about the animals and hint. About the animals and hint, about the animals and hint. We'll look at their tumulus, and if it is like an enormous molehill with a dark opening in its side, particularly if there are some badger tracks in the vicinity, we can draw our own conclusions. For I am inclined to believe that my beloved Arthur of the future is sitting at this very moment among his learned friends in the combination room of the College of Life and that they are thinking away in there for all they're worth about the best means to help our curious species. And I, for one, hope that someday, when not only England but the world has need of them, and when it is ready to listen to reason, if it ever is, they will issue from their wrath in joy and power, and then perhaps they will give us happiness in the world once more, and chivalry and the old medieval blessing of certain simple people who tried at any rate in their own small way to still the ancient, brutal dream of Attila the Hun. Explicit liber regis quandam, here ends the book of the one-time king, written with much toil and effort between the years 1936 and 1942, when the nations were striving in fearful warfare. Here also begins, if perchance a man may in future time survive the pestilence and continue the task he has begun, the hope of the future king. Pray for Thomas Mallory, knight, and his humble disciple, who now voluntarily lays aside his books to fight for his kind. Mm. 
for myself. I cannot forget the hedgehog's last farewell, coupled with Quixote's hint about the animals and Milton's, subter Milton's subterranean dream. It is little more than a theory, but perhaps the inhabitants of Bodden Tumulus. And if it is like an enormous molehill with a dark opening in its side, particularly if there are some badger tracks in the vicinity, we can draw our own conclusions. For I am inclined to believe that my beloved Arthur of the future is sitting at this very moment among his learned friends in the combination room of the College of Life and that they are thinking away in there for all they're worth about the best means to help our curious species. And I, for one, hope that someday, when not only England but the world has need of them, and when it is ready to listen to reason, if it ever is, they will issue from their wrath in joy and power, and then perhaps they will give us happiness in the world once more, and chivalry, and the old medieval blessing of certain simple people who tried at any rate in their own small way to still the ancient, brutal dream of Attila the Hun. Explicit liber regis quandam, here ends the book of the one-time king, written with much toil and effort, between the years 1936 and 1942, when the nations were striving in fearful warfare. Here also begins, if perchance a man may in future time survive the pestilence and continue the task he has begun, the hope of the future king. Pray for Thomas Mallory, knight, and his humble disciple, who now voluntarily lays aside his books to fight for his kind. Okay, hang on. Thank mm -hmm. you. 